Okay. Welcome back from lunch, everybody. I hope you all found something to eat at the van life convention downstairs. We've been hearing a, a lot today about large doses of psychedelics, but now we're going to hear about the small ones, microdosing. And we're going to get an introduction to micro microdosing from Dr. Kim Kuypers. Uh, unfortunately, she couldn't be here in person, but we're very happy to be able to welcome her online. Dr. Kuypers is an associate professor at the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands, where she works in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience. And for many years, her research has focused on empathy, cognition, and psychedelics. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you so much for the introduction. I hope that you can hear me. Um, thank you, Alps, for the invitation. I'm, I'm really grateful that you uh, invited me. And I'm really sorry that I was not able to um, come to Switzerland because of personal circumstances. I've never been in Switzerland, but uh, one day I will make it, I hope. Um, I hope that you already had a lot of nice talks and that you're not suffering from post-launch dip. Um, so yes, like uh, was stated in the introduction, I will talk about microdosing psychedelics. It's a really young field, I think. Um, and there is yeah, some con controversy uh, in the field, but I, I will talk about that later in my talk. So uh, let's try to move on through my presentation. Here are my disclosures. So um, I also conduct studies for MindMed, microdosing studies. These are not included in the presentation. And I'm also advise, an advisor for Clerk and Well Health and uh, the Mind Foundation. So um, as was stated in the introduction, I will give you uh, an overview of what or a definition of what microdosing is and an overview about the field. When we talk about microdosing, we talk about taking one tenth of a regular dose. And then we have to think about what is a regular dose. So when we think about uh, LSD, we between 100 and 200 micrograms is a regular dose. So a microdose is then between 10 and 20 micrograms. When we uh, look at psilocybin, it's more difficult. Um, I think it's uh, there also has not been uh, a lot of research. I would say it's in between one to three or even five milligrams of psilocybin, but then you will also uh, experience, I think, uh, slightly hallucinogenic effect, very small ones. Uh, people also microdose with other psychedelics like uh, ayahuasca, and that is also a new study, a new um, naturalistic study that we will start soon. It's not taking one dose, but it's taking it repeatedly for a certain period. And people intend to approve, improve certain aspects of their life without having the hallucinogenic effect. How do people microdose? That is, so we did a uh, survey study and we found out that it's very individual. So people might know of the fediment schedule that is shown here, which is taking a microdose on one day then leaving two days in between and then taking it on the fourth day. That was intended as a res some kind of research protocol so that you could experience the acute effects on day one, the subacute effects on day two, and then go back to normal on day three. And then uh, think it over whether microdosing is something for you or does something with your uh, whatever you intend to microdose for and then take it again. Here I've shown on the slides um, how you can microdose with LSD. So here uh, I, I show a blotter, which is cut up in small pieces. People can take it like that. Or some people uh, just put a tap in alcohol and then uh, they dissolve it. So LSD dissolves in the alcohol and then they can put it in their mouth with a syringe. Um, and then when people microdose with mushrooms, they can use dried or fresh mushrooms cut up. Uh, and here, what I've shown you, what I show you on this slide, it's what is sold online. So uh, for those of you who do not know, in the Netherlands, truffles are legal. So they are uh, sold uh, like this. 
And sometimes it also makes me a bit anxious because it really looks like some kind of medicine and it is still not a medicine. So people might be, might have the wrong idea and might trust it and then uh, take it. Why do people microdose? So there's certain motives. They want to increase their energy, their creativity, concentration, mood. They take it to study. They take it out of curiosity, but also to self-medicate. And in the next slides, I will tell you more about this. What are the reported benefits? So it is in line with the motives uh, when people take it to uh, enhance their creativity they also report that it enhances their cognitive and creative uh, performance people say that it reduces their feelings of anxiety and depression uh, they have enhanced insights enhanced mindfulness improved mood improved attitude towards life improved habits and health behaviors uh, also social interaction is improved and interpersonal connections and they have sometimes they also have a heightened sensation and uh, perception so how do we collect these data? Uh, I also collaborate with uh, the Quantified Citizen, which is shown here. This is uh, an app people can install and this app collects if people want to uh, participate in the studies, uh, collects baseline data, but also daily data about people's performance, their mood, whatever. So in one of these, so we have collected now a, a large database and in one of these, um, one of the outcomes was that people who microdose, but also with the intention uh, or people who state that they have uh, problems with depression or anxiety, their uh, levels of depression and anxiety are lower than the people who do not microdose and are also in, in the same sample. This, oh shoot, uh, I have to go back because that is a really cool, um, I, I think it's very cool graph. Uh, it is of our own data. So we recently finalized uh, a study in which we wanted to know because people state, uh, I take it to, to help me with ADHD. So we were interested in that. And we asked people with the intention to microdose for ADHD, whether we could follow them for four weeks. So, and these results are shown here on the y-axis, you see the ADHD symptoms at baseline. It's zero weeks at two weeks after microdosing and at four weeks after microdosing. And what we show in this naturalistic study is that the ADHD symptoms decrease over time, which I think is very cool. And they also decrease uh, under the clinical level. What is shown in the in the B panel and the other panel is, um, and I think it even strengthens the, the data. So we had people in our sample who only microdosed, but we also had people in the sample who took their ADHD medication next to their microdoses. And what is shown is both groups decrease in symptoms, but the group that also took the uh, their conventional medication alongside um, their microdoses did not um, decrease as quickly as the other group in symptoms. So here you see at two weeks they are um, at this level and at four weeks they are at the same level as the people who only microdose. This could not be explained by uh, the baseline symptoms of ADHD or comorbidity. So I, I yeah, it, it's something we really have to dig into more to understand uh, what the biological underpinnings of this are. But uh, and we will also start a study in uh, ADHD patients, a real uh, placebo-controlled study. So here we recruited uh, people via the microdosing institute. Um, besides all these nice things people report of microdosing about microdosing, there are also limitations. People say that they have problems with dosing. Uh, they feel uh, adverse physical effects, do not feel that well after microdosing. Um, people also have problems because they are taking uh, illegal substances and um, they're not, they do not know always about the quality of their uh, substances they take. Some do not even re uh, experience benefits. 
Some say that they have increased anxiety, while others take it just to decrease their anxiety. People say, I have unpleasant off days, so when not taking the microdose, they do not feel that well. Uh, they state these, uh, these uh, whatever, uh, increase in creativity or productivity are only short-lived. There are only mild benefits. Uh, and they have also concerns about uh, dependence, becoming dependent on microdosing. The big question I alluded to in the beginning of the talk is microdosing is a really young field. And while I think all people are convinced that full doses of a psychedelic are beneficial for mental health, there is a large debate whether microdosing really uh, helps for their mental health. So some state that it's a, a placebo effect or an expectancy effect. Uh, and that is why I actually compiled this presentation. So to look more into the placebo controlled studies that have been done uh, and not so much looking into the reported effects of people who microdose uh, daily. So I'm going to take you uh, through the studies, but first of all, I want to give you some terminology. So I will talk about placebo controlled studies, and this is the icon I will use for that. These are studies that take place in the lab where we give substances uh, that we know that this is the substance, we know the dose, we know the time of testing. Uh, the conditions are similar for all participants, also during all sessions. This might sound stupid, but their identity is confirmed well, when people take uh, uh, participate in studies online. And they might also ask somebody else to, to do the tests. Uh, so we have their confirmed identity and we can check for drug use, other drug use. So there is less noise in these placebo controlled studies compared to the naturalistic studies. There are also, uh, so the studies I will show, they are mostly placebo controlled naturalistic studies. How can that be? Uh, in the Netherlands, for example, a research group um, took advantage of a microdosing workshop where people went to and people could there pre prepare their own uh, placebo capsules and their capsules containing um, the microdose um, dose. So what is beneficial in these naturalistic studies? It can be, it will not always be, but it can be a personalized dose. People uh, will follow their own protocol. It's not always the case, but it can be. Um, they have less lifestyle restrictions. That is sometimes um, something I'm doubting when doing these lab studies. So. You tell them that they cannot smoke, that they uh, they will have dinner or lunch at a set time when while you are at home, you just eat whenever you want, you are more relaxed. And this can have an impact on tests. So that is also stated here, your own environment. So there is a higher ecologically uh, ecological validity. And of course, it costs less and you, you can have a larger sample size. But I also see one in between, one in between the placebo controlled study uh, that, that I showed you. Some people uh, ask people who microdose to come to the lab and do den tests. And I also really like this approach. Um, this is what I already told you. So they ask them people uh, to fill their capsules with the mushroom. And then there is the procedure. I, it's not uh, that important. What I like is looking into the, the methodology to really understand what they did. In some studies, they just have empty capsules. And then I'm also wondering if people might, might know that, um, that there's nothing in it. Um, some, or perhaps it's also because uh, of the methodology that is not explained that well. But in one article, I read that there was also edible mushroom in a capsule, another one without psychoactive um, effects. And what I told you, so participants come to the lab and some of the studies take a sample of the mushroom to then have a chemical analysis on so that you know what the dose was that people took. Oh yeah, 
when I have these numbers in between brackets, it are the references I used for the presentation. So at the end of the presentation, I will have an overview of all the um, references I used. So what are the levels you can test? You also know that you can look at a, a brain level where you ask people how they feel. Uh, you can test, you can run cognitive tests, or you can even do brain imaging. You can also look at the safety level. Do people experience unwanted effects or how is it going with their vital signs? So take blood pressure, heart rate. Uh, and you can also take biological uh, samples to um, identify biological markers, but also to identify the drug concentration, which is also very important in this kind of research. Before we move to the summary of all the studies, I want to show you this. We talked in the beginning what a microdose is. So what has been given in research is uh, between five and 20 micrograms of base LSD or uh, 6.5 to 26 micrograms of tartrate LSD. Why is this so important? Not all groups use the same LSD. And here you can see that you need a conversion uh, to go from base to tartrate LSD. So when you read, for example, uh, a paper by the, the lab in Chicago by Harry DeWitt, uh, they use star trade. So when they say 26 micrograms of LSD, then that is comparable, comparable to uh, or 20 micrograms of LSD we give. And I emphasize this because it is microdosing research and it's very important that we know the right dose. So, um, all the studies that have been published, uh, eight of the published papers gave single doses. So they investigated the acute effects of a single dose. There were three studies who gave LSD repeatedly. And here you see that um, it was in one study approximately two weeks, they gave four doses. And in another study, three weeks, six doses. I will come to that why I emphasize this. So in the studies who had, uh, that have used psilocybin, they were all uh, naturalistic or semi-naturalistic studies. Um, the studies that determined psilocybin in the samples uh, showed that there was 0.32 micrograms of psilocybin, 0.48 micrograms of psilocin. Here one stating 1.5 uh, micrograms and here one 1.5. 14 micrograms. If you remember what I stated in the beginning, that a microdose will probably be between one to three or even five uh, milligrams of psilocybin, this is a really low dose that these studies or that these people have taken, I think. Also important in these naturalistic studies is that the storing conditions of their mushrooms will influence uh, the content, so it can deteriorate over time. All these studies were repeated dosing studies. Here I use this symbol to show you that uh, people received multiple doses. And when I use this symbol, it's a single dose. So here you see that some people received microdosing for one week, two doses, three weeks, uh, five to seven doses, or four weeks, um, yeah, six doses, five weeks, 10 doses. Uh, but what we see is when they received repeated dosing, they in general received two doses per week. People now state um, that microdosing should take place for at least one month. On what this is based, I do not know exactly on what scientifically uh, data this is based, I don't know. But if this would be the case, and I will come to that uh, at, at the end of my talk, then all these studies have given, um, have not dosed enough. Um, at least these, these uh, placebo controlled studies here in these naturalistic studies, it's, it's better. So what do these studies show? If we look at the self-rated uh, questionnaires where we ask people or where we give people questionnaires and, and ask them about whether they feel the drug, or um, how they qualify this drug, uh, you see that there are effects. They've, they have increased feelings of field drug. Here, uh, this is all LSD. When there is a T, it's tartrate. When there is a B here, it's base. So it's uh, 
when I stated in the beginning, it's uh, I, I said that it's sub hallucinogenic. Uh, if you look at the five desk, you see that there are even uh, effects there. It's not sub hallucinogenic. It's also not sub perceptual. People really feel effects after taking a single dose of LSD. They experience positive mood, elation, increased figure, but also increased anxiety, confusion that I would uh, state are potentially negative effects. Some state the increase in anxiety can be a therapeutic um, mechanism by bringing the, the uh, feelings that are sub, uh, that are their, the latent feelings that they bring this to the uh, surface. Here you can also see in how many studies that these effects have been shown. When we look at the studies that have given uh, repeated doses, we see, uh, I think, a similar patter pattern. Um, but I have to say that all these studies have report acute effects. It are not accumulated effects. When we look at uh, self-rated, Things, and I, I will explain what this means, but stimulus based, uh, it, it means like we, for example, did a cold pressure test where we asked people to submerge their hand in uh, water of three degrees uh, for a no number of minutes. And then we asked them, how painful is this or how unpleasant is this? We showed that, for example, after a microdose, a single dose of LSD 20 micrograms, people stated that it was less painful, less unpleasant. We did not show uh, effects on emotional empathy. These are the things you do see with higher doses. And I also think that it, it relates to the social effects people do experience. So there it's the question, is it just because we're not able to measure it or are there just no effects on emotional empathy? This is also a test that we I think we assessed the three or five hours after people took the dose. So it might be it's already when when the LSD goes down, when the peak goes down. So perhaps it's due to that. Um, here is a study that that had um, a cyber use a cyber ball game. So it's a ball tossing game where you uh, as a participant can virtually throw the ball at people. And then some people will not return the ball when you are going when you are throwing that at them. So here, um, when people were socially rejected, they feel less negative mood when under the influence of LSD. And then when shown uh, with beautiful paintings, they had an increase in awe. When we look at task-based uh, measures, so when you give persons a working memory task like uh, the DSST, the digit, digit symbol substitution task where people are, are shown a row of symbols and a row of numbers and they then have to uh, decode what they are presented with. We, for example, have shown that they were able to correct, to correct less items, uh, to encode less items correctly, but we also showed that uh, in total, they, they identified or encoded less items. So it was more like people were slowing down. We also showed that after a single dose, they had less attentional lapses in, in um, a vigilance task. Uh, let me see. This is also, I think, yeah, you can also look at the, the separate things. This is also, I think, a, a nice finding. So I said that doing the cold pressure test they felt less, they experienced it as less painful. But we also showed that uh, the pain tolerance increased. They were able to, to hold their hand longer in the cold water uh, under the influence of LSD 20 micrograms. When you, we look at the repeated dosing studies, there are not a lot of effects in these studies. One showed an over reproduction of uh, an. Um, time perception task, so, uh, and that was mostly with the intervals that took two to four seconds, so that people are uh, not paying, or not, uh, time is going less fast as it really is going in, in, um, in reality. When we look at these studies uh, who, um, were naturalistic or the ones in between. There are um, 
how to say it, not a lot of effect. You see that these uh, studies have used a lot of questionnaires but do not show effects or here in the task based, the studies that use tasks, it is shown that, for example, creativity is enhanced. Uh, so divergent thinking, thinking out of the box. Um, and this is, yeah, actually a study that I really like because they use uh, natural speech, so interviews, uh, which is, I think, a more ecologically valid measure. And they uh, showed increased verbosity, so more words, and an increased sentiment score, but only when reporting about uh, the changes related to their perception, mood, and alert. When we go to the uh, brain level or to the imaging level, uh, there are some studies. I think uh, I think there were three studies that have included these measures. So this was a study that included functional imaging. What they showed was increased connectivity between uh, certain brain areas. But uh, this is of interest, I think. They uh, and it's also depicted in this um, graph. Where you show where you see the connectivity between the amygdala and the middle frontal gyrus, this connectivity was increased, and this was also positively related to the increase in positive mood under the influence of LSD. I think yeah, it was 13 micrograms of tartrate, so uh, 10 micrograms of base LSD. These findings are in line with the other studies in which they gave uh, higher doses of LSD. Here I will show you two studies who did EEG measures. One study was a, a placebo-controlled study in which they gave uh, two doses of LSD. Here you see it, where is my cursor? So they gave zero um, micrograms of LSD, 13 and 26 uh, micrograms of tartrate LSD. And what you see is uh, resting state data where they asked people to have their eyes closed. Um, and their eyes open and you see that there is uh, a decrease here in theta beta and gamma uh, when people have their eyes closed and open but only in the highest microdose condition when you look at the psilocybin study in which they gave uh, 0.32 micrograms uh, of psilocybin uh, they only showed decreased power in the theta range, so uh, this uh, oscillation, and only in the eyes closed, not in the eyes open condition. It can be that it is because they gave very low dose, or people took a very low dose, and that the, here you, you see uh, that it's, it, you really benefit from giving um, different doses, so that you have, can show a dose-response uh, dose relationship. Uh, again, here also, like uh, the functional imaging data, these EEG data are in line with the higher dosing studies. Um, and what is shown that there is an inverse relationship between the oscillations um, here, that you measure with EEG and the neural activity you can measure with functional imaging. And why, uh, what about these data waves? These data waves are uh, important in cognition and behavior, so important in learning and uh, memory, for example. So I think more research has to look into this. What do I show you here? There has been one very interesting study, I think, by the uh, group in Copenhagen. They looked at, so they gave, uh, here you see, uh, a number of subjects, different doses of psilocybin. Uh, and they assessed their uh, receptor occupancy uh, of the 5-HT2A receptor with a PET scan. And for us, uh, it's really important to look at the red dot. So here and here, 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 and here. Um, so what did they do is uh, for some subjects, they uh, put them twice in the PET scanner. So also for this participant that received three micrograms of psilocybin, they tested them one hour uh, after the ingestion of uh, psilocybin, but also approximately six hours after the ingestion. And why I think this is very important, you see that one hour after a small dose of psilocybin, you see that there is receptor binding. So there is really something something happening at brain level. 
just had, in the beginning, I, I told you there is a lot of um, people are, not all people are convinced that microdosing is real, but here you see that there is something real happening uh, in the brain. Uh, here you see the occupancy uh, in the brain and the intensity of the effect. Uh, here you see that they feel something and this is then related to the receptor binding. You also see that when receiving a higher dose, the intensity of the experience is higher and the binding is higher. And here, here you see the psilocybin concentration in blood and the intensity ratings. Uh, these are also related. What we showed, and I think again, this is evidence that microdosing or even a small dose of a psychedelic really does something. We showed that uh, LSD increases BDNF in uh, blood. So what you see here, this is time uh, after administration of LSD, and this is the BDNF in uh, the plasma, blood plasma. What we showed is that uh, after five micrograms and after 20 micrograms, the BDNF levels went up. We did not show this with uh, 10 micrograms, but you see a, a similar pattern when you look at the graph. Uh, perhaps it, it, we, we just did not have enough power because the sample size was small, I don't know. Or perhaps there is just something different when you take 10 micrograms of LSD, I don't know. But the interesting thing here is um, a very low dose of LSD does something at a biological level, but also if you look at the higher dose of LSD, it seems that the peak has yet to come and we're here at six hours after administration. The question here is, um, so we show this after a single dose of LSD, what happens if you really microdose and uh, take LSD repeatedly? When we look at ketamine studies, it has been shown that um, so ketamine also increases the neuroplasticity or the BDNF response, but this decreases after repeated use. So the question now is, if you take a psychedelic repeatedly, does this uh, do something with this plasticity response? Preclinical studies show that if you give it repeatedly, a high dose of a psychedelic, you still have increased neuroplasticity. So this is reassuring, but I think it should be invested. This is the last slide I will show you uh, about things on a biological level. Uh, here you see that I, I told you in the beginning, it's very important to take blood to understand uh, what the concentration is in blood. And you see the higher the dose, so five micrograms here is uh, eight micrograms, 10, 16, and 20. The higher the dose, the higher uh, the blood levels, which is something you expect. There is one study that gave it repeatedly, and it shows uh, still the same uh, increase in, in blood concentrations of LSD after, the, after repeated dosing. So um, it, it indicates that uh, it also indicates that LSD will not accumulate in the body when you take it repeatedly. And here, uh, for as a comparison, I show you uh, how high the levels are. Um, yeah, high, how high the levels are in the blood if you take higher doses of LSD. Here, it, the graph ends at uh, 1,000, and here uh, you also see it 1,000. So, and this is then with a 50 microgram dose up until 20, uh, 200 micrograms. What about the safety? Because it's very important if you are going to give um, LSD or psilocybin repeatedly to, to participants, uh, we showed, but other people show, showed it too, that blood, blood pressure can be elevated, but it's still here, like shown in a normal or slightly elevated range. It's not a high blood pressure or not, um, it's not ex extreme increases that you see. Um, also here in the bottom of the slide, I, I show you that some people report adverse events that they have headaches, um, and that these are higher than in the placebo group. So that there can be adverse effects. So to summarize, when we look at the brain level, the self ratings, the cognitive tasks, but also the brain parameters, it is shown that a single dose of LSD or psilocybin has effects on your mood state. It even 
it, it increases your positive mood, but it can also increase your negative mood, like, like that it can, uh, can increase anxiety or confusion. It has positive effects on attention, creativity, pain tolerance, and it also affects brain connectivity, oscillations, and receptor binding. Uh, when we look at the safety, we see that it's overall well tolerated by participants. There are, um, and yeah, this is then not true, no adverse psychological or physical uh, effects were reported. This was for one study, but then in another study, some people reported, uh, like I said, headaches. Uh, it seems safe uh, in these doses, uh, but people have slightly elevated blood pressure. pressure. Uh, when we look at the biological measures, we see that BDNF levels are increased and the concentrations are detectable in blood at really low levels. This is a very important remark I have to make. I already told you it are only acute effects that studies have looked at. There is, I think, one study that showed or that tested the effects uh, at follow-up after a microdosing uh, of a couple of weeks. And did, they did not show uh, persistent, persistence of effects. So it are mostly single dose studies that have been conducted mostly with LSD and mostly with health or only in healthy volunteers. So the question now is what now, what do we have to do? It seems promising, at least for me, uh, how should we move forward? So there are a couple of questions I think that need to be addressed. We should understand whether there is biological uh, tolerance, because you also know that if you take a psychedelic, you will have biological tolerance. What uh, happens if you take small doses? Um, I think that with a receptor binding study, you will be able to uh, answer that question. But there is also the difficulty that uh, you cannot repeat a PET scan that often. So that's also thinking uh, about the design, and I'm not very into these, these pet studies, so people will know how much time you uh, have to leave in between, I cannot give you the details. Um, also, what I think is, is very interesting is to understand the biological mechanism. As I told you in the beginning, the study in the ADHD patients, we did the naturalistic study, we showed that uh, people who took their conventional treatment that are mostly uh, substances working on a dopaminergic level, um, they kind of blocked the effect or slowed down the effect. So it would be interesting to know um, how it really works, um, whether the effects are really um, through the, the 5-HT2A receptor or whether there are other mechanisms downstream. So you could uh, do uh, receptor blocking of the 5-HT2A receptor, but you could also try to block the neuroplasticity effect uh, with rapamycin that has been done, uh, or this compound has been used already in preclinical research. Uh, I thought a lot about personal factors that, that can influence these effects, and I really think that in microdosing research, it's even more important. There are studies showing that your biological sex, your personal, or even your personality uh, affect your, or have a relation uh, with the receptor binding. So for example, like I show you here, um, oh yeah, that's not an example. Yeah, yeah. but uh, so biological sex and personality are linked to receptor binding, but also in another study, it was shown that uh, women experience the effects earlier than men. So why is this the case? Uh, we also know that uh, if you don't sleep well for one day, you will have increased 5-HT2A receptor binding. So that's also interesting to test. Uh, and could this be true for the, the studies that we have done in the lab? Is it because they're anxious to come to the lab that they do not sleep that well and that we show effects and that this effect is not shown in that or not that much shown in naturalistic studies where people just stay at home and, and are more at ease? Um, what about weight? Uh, in the lab, we do not adjust for the dose for weight. Um, is this needed in microdosing? Because we're talking about these very small doses. Um, and age, it has also been shown that there is a reduced receptor binding with increasing age. There has been one repeated dosing study with LSD that was done in uh, older participants. And the only effect they showed was on time perception, so the over-reproduction of the time interval. 
but these are all things that research has to take into account. I think we also should look at negative effects. Uh, I showed you that there, there uh, are effects at the blood pressure level, but there are also concerns about um, the heart because, um, for example, LSD also has affinity for the 5-HT2B receptor, which is linked with a heart condition. There is a lot of discussion in the fields. Uh, people state, yes, that has been shown in the past with fenfluramine at high doses. Um, and that you should also, it, it only happens when you have uh, sensitivity for, for this heart condition. But I think studies just have to uh, monitor this or uh, do tests pre and post uh, at outtake or at, at the end of the studies. We also have to look at what I said. Uh, BDNF, uh, is this when you give a uh, uh, psychedelic repeatedly, do you still see the BDNF response? We know that uh, psychedelics work on the immune system. Is this also the case for microdosing? Uh, we will also have to look at cognitive integrity. What if you take repeated doses uh, of a psychedelic? Does it affect your memory performance, for example? As we have shown, or as I showed, that uh, a single dose uh, affects your theta oscillations, which is uh, implicated in learning and memory. So again, if you take it repeatedly, does something change? We need to look at patient populations because, as I told you, all these studies have been done in healthy volunteers, but uh, people stay to self-medicate with psychedelic. Um, and, and it can be the case that you really need to have a, a deficit to show larger effects uh, of microdosing. How does this uh, sample have to look like? I think you need some people uh, without psychedelic experience. You need some with psychedelic experience, uh, but then without microdosing experience, you need a, a real uh, mix of people uh, and have to take care of their expectations. So what about the indications? We have conducted a couple of years ago, a study in which we were interested in self-medication with psychedelics. And we asked people, do you have a, a diagnosed disorder? Do you take a psychedelic to, to deal with it? Or, and do you take uh, microdosing to deal with it? And this is what we showed. So uh, when people, so these were the disorders that, that uh, were mentioned. And we asked people, if you microdose and compare it to the conventional treatment you receive, what do you think? But they said for neurodevelopmental disorders, they think uh, they thought that microdosing worked better than the conventional treatment. The symptoms disappeared better than the conventional therapy and the quality of life improved. This is how you should read the table. This is also true for ADHD. You see some effects on even bipolar, depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, substance related disorders and addiction and personality disorders. Next, we also asked them so these would then be indications you want to look into. Next, we ask them if you compare uh, your self-medication with microdoses, um, with the regular dose of a psychedelic, um, actually only ADHD, they thought was better helped with microdosing compared to a regular dose of a psychedelic. For the depressive disorders and the anxiety disorders, they thought that a regular dose was better. Click, click. Uh, what do we, so uh, which so which conditions should we look into? I think ADHD, but still depression is interesting because people state that they microdose for this indication. And also uh, these conditions, uh, so depression, anxiety disorder, but also addiction, personality disorders. Um, I told you in the beginning when I said I really like to study with natural uh, speech, I think we really should move into more ecologically developed measures. This is always so difficult when testing people in the lab, when people say, oh, it increases my creativity, but what is creativity? Uh, we then use tests like alternate uses, an alternate uses task where we state, hey, here you have a pencil. What could you do more with this pencil uh, than writing? Is this really creativity? I don't know. It are validated creativity tests, but still we need more. 
better measures. Uh, that's why we made use, and still not published, but we made use of a story writing task in which people were given two words and given a lot of time to write a story about it. Uh, we showed that the uh, authentic, and how, now I have to dig deep, I think the authentic value of the story went up and the social value went down. So we showed some effects of microdosing, but only um, with the smallest dose. I think we should move into natural language. You can um, see whether the, the language is richer or wh whether they talk more about their themselves or others or positive mood things or negative mood things. And I really see potential for virtual reality um, in this guidance research. Biological measures are needed. We need to look into hormones like cortisol, but also oxytocin. Uh, immune system level, uh, immune system markers are needed, neuroplasticity, pharmacokinetics, very important to understand uh, the, the blood levels of the substance and, and whether it goes together with the response. And I really think that we need a, a, some basic set of measures amongst all studies so that we can start pooling the data because I really think that a large sample size is needed in this kind of research. This is um, how do you say that the elephant in the room i did not talk about uh, i told you in the beginning you have believers and non-believers when it comes to microdosing and the non-believers state well it's all because of expectancy it's because of people are breaking blinds it is true that people are able to identify the condition when the dose increases and here i have shown you some um, um, examples of studies what I like in the, um, so Harriet DeWitt in Chicago, they have an other procedure. They tell people you can either re receive a hallucinogen, a stimulant, a cannabinoid, or a sedative. And here you see when they use this approach, it is diff more difficult to uh, have a correct guess. So um, I think with this procedure, you can um, reduce the expectancy effects about on, on behavioral measures. Um, oh, what's more, uh, indeed, expectancy can have a large effect, but I do think, and this is what I state here, um, when we do, do studies in the lab, we just uh, recruit people. They have sometimes, they don't have experience with, with a microdose or with a psychedelic, sometimes they do. Um, I think their motivation is different. They are they, they do not have the intention to use the drug to solve a certain condition. We just give them the drug and we test a, a range of effects. When you uh, have these uh, naturalistic studies, um, people might already have certain expectancies and this might be shown then on the measures. Some states uh, use niacin as a control because niacin, uh, vitamin B3, uh, induces um, um, physiological effects. Uh, it, it increases your temperature a bit, you have flushing. Um, but then the question is, should you use that? Because it's also known that it enhances cognition, vitamin B3, and if you're going to take it repeatedly, it might, uh, um, how do you say that make your data or reduce the, the effect you see with microdosing? What you should do, I think, is when you ask somebody in which condition uh, are you, to ask for a justification of the treatment guess. Oh, you think you had LSD. Why do you think that? So that you can learn about um, how they, they uh, guess it. Uh, another question is, do we need to take care of the sets and the setting? Uh, there was one study uh, showing that there was a positive relationship between the dose and the vigilance reduction. People said, I felt sleepy, my thoughts and actions were slowed down, I was, was on the verge of fainting. It can be the case that if you uh, have people in the lab uh, where they are, and we do not confine people to the bed all day, but some studies might do that, they might feel sluggish. Um, and, and it, it might also uh, influence your effects. Um, what I also like to do is look at lifestyle. This is also uh, different among studies. Uh, in one study, I read that they had to fast for 12 hours and then they received uh, a granola bar and then something uh, for lunch. Um, and then there's also abstaining from drug use, but that includes then um, that 
sometimes includes caffeine and nicotine. It, it depends. So it can be the case that if you do a lab study that you have in, in, you know, in our case, I can tell you people uh, cannot smoke and cannot drink uh, caffeine. So they might, uh, and if you have people who use it a lot, they might already be a bit in their withdrawal phase. So you have uh, created a deficit that you can help uh, with a psychedelic, uh, I would think. So I really think that if you're comparing the findings of studies, it's good to look into the methodology to understand what were the restrictions that people um, had to endure. So um, I'm almost, I, this is, I think, my last slide. Um, what I think is, and then looking at this balance, when you look at naturalistic studies where people can self-administrate, it is mostly, it is repeated dosing. It is a personalized dose. Uh, this is linked to the point that I make here, the dose titration. Um, where, when you look on the internet, and we also collaborate with the Microdosing Institute, uh, they really help people with their microdosing uh, schedule pattern. They put them through a titration phase where people can um, test different doses and make up for themselves uh, which dose works the best for them. This might be the way to go. Because in our study, we, we for example, also showed that uh, attention increased, but not for everybody. And then the question is, why is this? Was the dose too low for some people? Uh, you should, I think uh, it, the studies, naturalistic studies also learn us that people have personalized dosing schemes. So would that be better than the standardized schemes? Um, what I also think is we have to look at, is there a biological tolerance or uh, even are some people faster metabolizers? So I told you not all people benefited, uh, their attention benefited from LSD. Is this because they are faster metabolizers? Um, it, it, and also the reason why I uh, say this is some people want to correct correct for um, the, the fact that people uh, have a, a correct treatment, yes. But what if people who do feel it uh, are not the fast metabolizers or the other way around? What if people do not feel it, uh, that they are uh, fast metabolizers and therefore also do not have effects on a cognitive level? So these are questions that need to be answered. Uh, we also need, I think, more receptor binding studies taking into account the age of people, uh, gender or biological sex, personality and sleep. And uh, in the beginning, I also told you, I showed you uh, when these repeated dosing studies, um, these repeated dosing studies gave it for two, three, four weeks. And then I also made the remark, people say that you have to take it for at least uh, four weeks. So then I'm thinking if you already see changes after an acute dose on a BDNF level, um, why does it have to take them four weeks? Is there something that has to change? Do you need changes, for example, in the gut to have then uh, an effect on a biological level, uh, on a cognitive level? This, this is also something that, that needs to be addressed, I think, in future microdosing studies. Here, are the references I used. You can take a picture or perhaps you already uh, have the slides. The references. And then here are, before I, I end, I would like to uh, show you the psychedelic research team, Maastricht, and also the upcoming projects. We're going to do a LSD microdosing study in healthy volunteers, but also in patients with ADHD. We're going to start a study in which we give a psilocybin to patients with fibromyalgia. And we're also going to do a study in which we give uh, medium doses of LSD to couples and test their social behavior. I would like to thank your attention and sorry that I was not able to be there um, in person, but I'm now, uh, yeah, I can now answer your questions if you have some. Thank you. We have like 10 minutes for questions we can take. Um, um, I'm wondering if, um, if I understood, we don't have data um, about uh, 
um, if you use uh, in a continuous way uh, the long term efforts or after uh, stop taking yes correct so uh, actually so with the the quantified citizen app you can have that data but then it is uh naturalistic so you do not know exactly you you know the substance that people take but you do not know the exact dose uh you know their schedule so this is this i would regard as preliminary evidence to understand how people are functioning after they took it for months or perhaps years so soon i think we we will have more insights but i do think that we need uh uh, data from placebo-controlled studies to to have a better understanding. Uh, I'm, I thank you very much for your work. I wanted to ask if you have any experience with co-medication with uh, opioids, with tramadol, for instance, uh, if the effect is... Uh, uh, diminished or do you have any experience no and that's a good question because i presented you the data from the adhd uh, patients so this is this is a study that could be conducted where you indeed ask people do you microdose and do you take conventional uh, medication next to it but i i don't think um i don't think that that's that this has uh, been done yet what, what we see is that people uh, who microdose also change their uh, lifestyle, also drink less alcohol. Uh, so it could also be the case with co-medication that they diminish this. I don't know. Yeah. It's an interesting uh, topic to, to uh, explore. Thank you. Um, at a certain point in the PowerPoint, you named that <coughs> you said um, that microdosing had positive effects on ADHD symptoms. Yeah. Um, are these the same effects in regular, regularly used um, medications like Ritalin, or is it a different effect? <laughs> Good question. Oh, and now I cannot give the answer. Um, I I don't I don't know whether the uh, whether the symptoms were reduced to the same level as uh, after uh, methylphenidate. Um, what I do know that it was not uh, clinically significant anymore, the, or not at a clinical relevant level anymore. And I think an important difference is too that people who microdose do not take it uh, every day. Most of the people do not take it every day. Well, Ritalin is something you have to take every day. Also, an important difference is that people uh, report that. After taking a conventional treatment that they do not feel themselves anymore or they have numb uh, personality, which is something they do not feel when microdosing. So I would not say you have to, and we still have to wait the findings from the clinical trial. I would not say that you have to replace uh, all these conventional treatments of ADHD with microdosing, but I do think that it it potentially can be an option for people who do not want to have these adverse effects, I think, they report from uh, using methylphenidate. Um, hello. Um, do we know what is the effects of uh, um, microdosing while taking antidepressants? Yeah. Um, so also there, I don't think that there there is uh, at the moment data. I do think that people will uh, combine it. Um, if we look at higher doses, and Matthias Lichty, who is also uh, present amongst you, has done a study in which he um, put people on an SSRI and then gave psilocybin and showed, uh, I think, even enhanced effects. So um, I don't know whether that would be the case with microdosing. I, I, I don't know. It, uh, it is research that, that could be done, yeah. Okay, thank you.
Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. I have a question about uh, possible interaction with the menstrual cycle, especially with uh, PMS syndrome. So if maybe taking it instead of doing for a month, but only for the week before or something like that. I see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, such a nice question. Actually, we, we started last year, we, we started a study, a naturalistic study in which we asked people um, whether they were uh, intending to take or whether they microdose for PMS symptoms or, or PMDD symptoms. And we asked them, can you do it one month microdosing and then not the second month? And then we randomized it. Uh, but we had to stop the study because uh, it was too difficult. People also uh, thought it was, um, so they, they mixed up the schedule. Um, we know that people take it for their PMS symptoms and there was even a patient who uh, contacted me. She said, I really want to participate in your study, but uh, I cannot handle my symptoms when I do not microdose. So it was that severe. So there has to date not been done a, a controlled study. I do think that it's necessary, um, but we, we don't know at this stage. stage. Thank you. Last question, maybe? Yes, sorry, I have the microphone. That's okay. okay. Um, really great talk, thank you. I'm just wondering, uh, have you looked at the impact on the organs, kidneys, liver, etc., in microdosing? No, we didn't. Um, and I'm thinking, uh, I think in the next study, we will take blood samples to test the integrity by looking at, yeah, I, I'm not a medical doctor, but I know you can look at certain levels. Um, so this is something that, that will be done, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kuypers. We're out of time. Everyone give a round of applause. <laughs> thank you.